Okay, so let us review uh, chapters 31 and 32. For, uh, and, uh, and here's the list of things that we're going to talk about. Just, just kind of review it. Um, and we have, uh, we're going to talk about Faraday's Law and uh, how emotional EMF is a kind of a quote unquote easy way to visualize what's going on. Uh, then we'll have Lenz's Law, which is the hardest thing to say. I mean, it's the hardest, uh, it, it doesn't really, it's, it's hard to describe mathematically. There's no equation for it, it's just how you figure out what direction the induced current's going to be in. Uh, then we'll talk about the general form of uh, Faraday's law, and that leads to, to listing Maxwell's equations. Um, and then uh, we're going to describe uh, an electrical device, uh, the inductor. We'll talk about the self-inductance of a circuit, which usually we neglect because uh, in a circuit we'll have this thing called an inductor, which dramatically increases the inductance of a circuit, just as a resistor dramatically increases the resistance uh, in a circuit, so does an inductor do the inductance, and RL circuits, and LC circuits, and we'll talk about the energy stored in magnetic field. We are not going to talk about RLC circuits. There are such things. But that's the, the, the next section. Uh, that's uh, where this class stops. So take more physics classes if you want to do RLC circuits. Okay, so let's start with Faraday's Law. And Faraday's law, whoops, there's an A in there, Faraday's law. And it basically says this, hey, if you're gonna, if you have a loop of wire, doesn't matter what the loop looks like, and it's got some magnetic field uh, going through it, um, and, uh, well, well, I'll just use the X's like this. But it can be an angle. It doesn't have to be perpendicular to the loop. It could be an angle to that loop. Okay. The um, and this represents the magnetic field. And this is some conducting loop. Conducting loop, right? A wire. It just says that you're going to get a voltage or an EMF. That's why we use that uh, symbol. It's quite often called a back EMF. You're going to get a voltage in that wire. And the voltage is going to be exactly equal to the rate of change of magnetic flux. Um, that's contained by this loop, the amount of magnetic flux. And the negative sign, that's Lenz's law. Or uh, that's going to tell you the, this is a way of saying, okay, the uh, EMF or will be a voltage that will be such that it will create a current that will oppose the rate of change of magnetic flux. Okay. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's Faraday's law. Anytime you have a wire and there's, you know, current in the, uh, and there's a magnetic field in there, if you change the magnetic field, you're going to create a voltage in that wire. And that wire, well, of course, the wire's probably got some resistance to it. And so, you know, we have, you know, E equals IR. You know the the uh, the resistance and the current will obey Ohm's law in that wire. And of course, if I take this and I say, well, I got one loop and two loops and three. If I take I coil the wire up so it's in a bunch of loops, you just multiply that by n. It just n is just a multiplier number of loops. Just multiplies the effect. Um, also, uh, remember that what is magnetic flux in terms of magnetic field? This is really uh, um, the, the amount of magnetic flux is equal to the magnetic field dotted with the area, B dot A. I mean, you, you could, or, you know, if you really want to get, if the area uh is not a uniform area or something like that, or the field isn't uniform, or you have to integrate it. 
Quite often, this is all you need right here. And so when you're taking the derivative of this, of, of, of uh, the magnetic flux, you're taking the derivative of B dot A. And so you have to use the product rule. Now, in almost all the problems you're going to have, one of these is going to change with time and the other is going to be constant with time. So the thing that's going to be constant with time comes out of the derivative. Uh, quite, you know, I think there was a problem on, on one of the practice tests we talked about where B was a function of time. The magnetic field, the loop wasn't changing with time, but, but B was. Now remember, B dot dA is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B. I'm sorry, <laughs> magnitude of the magnetic field, magnitude of the area times the cosine of the angle between them. And this could be a function of time. Theta could be a function of time, right? If you have a, a, a wire that's in a uniform magnetic field, a loop of wire, but it's rotating, like in a, a motor or something like that, well, B isn't changing with time, and the area isn't changing with time. What's changing with time is that angle. Quite often, like this is omega t or something like that. So whatever is varying with time, that's what you operate the derivative on, and all the constant stuff just stays right you can take the so keep that in mind when you're using this they'll quite often give you a function or the magnetic field is a function of time or the area is a function of time as in the case of motional emf or a, a loop rotating in a magnetic field like a motor or a generator or something like that you'll have the angle as a function of time so uh there you go now, an emotional EMF problem, and these are very common, you'll have a, um, two rails that are made out of metal so they can conduct. And then you connect them with some kind of wire, some kind of conductor. You might have a resistor over here. And then you have some magnetic flux contained by this, in this space. And almost always it's uniform. And by the way, these things really don't exist, you know, except in the imagination of physics teachers. Because, <coughs> well, I mean, nobody builds these things, okay? They're, they're thought experiment types of things. But then you put a bar across here that is a conductor. So you do have a conducting loop here. And you grab this thing and you apply a force to it. So here's my applied force. This is somebody from the outside world grabbing this thing and pulling it on it. Well, what have we got in here? This is a conducting, this is a conductor. So there are charges in it that are free to move. Now, of course, they're really electrons, but we pretend that they're positive charge carriers because Benjamin Franklin guessed wrong. Okay, so let's put a few positive free to move charges in there. And what happens is that if you think about this and you go, okay, F equals QV cross B. When you start moving this bar, this bar is going to have a velocity to the right. And then, so now you use the right-hand rule and you have V cross over to B. My thumb goes straight up. And so what happens is you get an electric force on there. And that force acts on all these charges and forces them to move. And you get a voltage, let's say this is L, this is the length of my bar in here. And so um, you, you get a, a voltage that acts like this and the magnitude of that, that uh, voltage, well it's just, um, well, hold on a second. This creates a current, and that current flows around. But when you have a current in a wire, that current in a wire applies a force to the wire. And that, uh, that, this, that equation is described by F equals I L cross B. Now, this is chapter 29 stuff. So I'm just going to say, OK. You know this equation. This is the effect of a magnetic field on a freely moving charged particle. 
This is really the, the equation you want to look at, though. This is the force that a magnetic field applies to a current. So here we have a current flowing like this. And you go uh, F equals I uh, L cross over to B. And so we get a magnetic force acting on this that uh, opposes, and we'll call this F sub B. Now at first, let's say that this, this rod here was at rest, uh, and then you start grabbing and you start pulling it, you accelerate it up to a certain uh, velocity. Well, okay, then this applied force would be greater than the magnetic force, but what if the, what if the thing is being pulled at constant velocity to the right? So that this applied force, that means this applied force will be exactly equal to that magnetic force on the bar. They'll cancel each other out. We're neglecting any friction. So we say, well, um, this right here, well, okay, this is the force that's really doing work. But let's, uh, let's talk about the voltage here. So, um, let's see, E equals uh, the electric field times the length. Okay, the electric field is really, uh, oh, I'm starting to lose it here. Uh, this, this electric force, oh, that's right. The electric force on these charges, well, if you take the force and you divide it by the charge that's in there, that's the electric field. And so the force on here is QV cross B. So this is going to be uh, E equals uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh, QV cross B over Q. Well, this Q cancels out. So you get this very interesting little thing that the electric field that's in this, this wire right here that's driving these Currents is up is just equal to the cross product between velocity and magnetic uh, field. Now let's say everything's all nice and perpendicular, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to call it VB. So now we get this electric, uh, this voltage is equal to uh, VBL. And for some reason, in uh, all the books I've seen, it's BLV. They call it BLV. But, and this is the motional uh, EMF. Now, really, uh, you have, so the, yeah. And so, and also we can see that the direction of this current is going to be up like this, over like this, down like this, down like this. That's the current because we're forcing the positive charges to move that way. Okay, well, positive, when currents move, they create magnetic flux. That magnetic flux um, will oppose the rate of change here. Look, we're, as we, when we move this thing to the right, we're increasing the amount of magnetic flux contained by that loop. And so the, current, the direction of the current opposes that rate of change. So the, the, the magnetic flux created by the current will be in an upward direction because the increase in flux is downward. Now, if, the, if, this, if this bar here is moved the other direction, it's just the opposite is true. And so as you move it towards the left, we're decreasing the amount of uh, magnetic flux contained by the loop, and the direction of the current reverses itself in such a way that it's trying to say, no, 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 I like it, I like it. So it's going to go in this direction, and if you use the right-hand rule for loops of current, it's going to... Uh, up it opposes the rate of change of flux. So Lenz's law is contained in motional EMF as well as uh, Faraday's law because, and here's how Faraday's law is, is contained in there. If you look at this E, well, this is B, L, and then what is, what is V? V is 
uh, dx dt. Okay, well, what is a dx? Here's a little dx. Let's say this is the x-axis. So here's a little dx. So here's a little tiny bit of, if I go dx times l, what is that? Well, it's a little tiny bit of area. So this is uh, going to be equal to b times the ADT. Well, b times a is the amount of flux contained. And so the EMF is equal to B times A. And again, the negative just means that the, the EMF will create a current that will oppose the rate of change of magnetic flux contained by the loop. So this is a motional EMF. Motional means that you're, you're moving some bar in that magnetic field and changing the area of the loop, right? You're really changing the area of the loop in this. And um, so it's a relatively easy way of seeing uh, Faraday's law and Lenz's law in action. See, this is what I was afraid was going to happen. It's going to take too long. Mm. Uh, so let's more formally state Lenz's law, where Lenz's law and uh, we saw it in that one um, FRQ, but uh, no, it wasn't FRQ. It was a multiple choice question, right, for the E and M test. But if if you have um, a conducting loop and again it doesn't have to be a circle or square or anything it can be any shape and if you have a magnet and that magnet has magnetic flux creates magnet a lines of magnetic field you know that comes out of this thing if I um, now you can see if I do this the way I'm drawing this if, if it's down here if I were able to take this North Pole magnet and shove it upwards more and more and more of the flux will enter the loop and the loop doesn't like that it says no 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 i don't like all this extra flux so and this is in the front by the way we're look, kind of looking down on this so what this loop's going to do is says, i'm going to create a current that's going to pose that rate of change of flux so again the right hand rule for the induced uh, flux it, it says oh more and more like this i want to create a magnetic field that opposes that change so i'm going to create a magnetic field that's downward and the way to do that use your right hand for and, and, and go around like this uh, so the only way to do that is to create a current in that way so if i'm moving this magnet up if the motion of this magnet is upwards Thus, I'm increasing the magnetic the amount of magnetic flux pointed up. That's going to induce a current that's in that direction. Now, what if I just hold the magnet there and don't move anything? There's no rate of change of magnetic flux in that loop, so there's no induced current. But if I take that loop, and take my North Pole and now remove it like this. It's like it says, uh, no, 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 I don't change the amount of flux. I'm going to oppose that change. So if you're having less and less flux, the direction of the current will be in this, this direction to try to create flux that's up. Because even though the magnetic field lines from this magnet are still up, we're reducing the amount that's up. So it wants, it wants to create more upward flux to, to oppose the rate of change. Now, I don't know a better way to explain that. I really, th this I've been, for years, been trying to figure out a simple, clean way to explain Lenz's law, but it's, it's opposing, it's not opposing the flux. It's opposing the rate of change of flux. It's trying to keep the flux the way it was, okay? So that's Lenz's Law, and they'll find various devious ways to try to test your understanding of Lenz's Law, 
they'll give you different uh, loops or whatever and you know, like what is the direction of the induced current clockwise or counterclockwise or when is it zero now if you were to look uh, let's let's create uh, let's take a look at more magnetic flux if I have uniform magnetic flux like this and then I'm going to create like a a donut of, of here's a conducting a wire okay and I've just given it some we just said that the EMF in this wire uh, is equal to negative uh, dv dt okay but we also know that um, that it, it's as if there's a uh, we are if we change the the magnetic flux on here let's see if I let's say I'm in, let's say B is increasing with time like B the magnetic field as a function of time is like seven Teslas per second times T right so so now the the magnetic field is increasing as a function of time well um, what is that going to do well I've got more and more and more the, the, the magnetic field lines are the more of them are it's like they're all moving in and this is going to say oh no I don't want more so it's going to induce this current or it's going to induce a current to oppose that rate of change and these these uh, positive charge carriers in the wire are going to have feel forces that are tangential right to this and of course they can't get off the wire so they just they they, they rotate around the current is going to be in this direction because it's opposing the rate of change of flux into the table well that means that these have this acts as if there's a little electric field in here And this uh, uh, electric field will push on this guy all the way around. So what is the, the change in voltage? Well, I, I mean, this, this EMF, well, it's equal to E dot ds. And uh, this, is, this is called the general form. sign belongs and if it's a close and we're going to go all the way around and that'll be the voltage added to this so here's what's kind of interesting about Faraday's law expressed in this form the uh, if you change the magnetic flux you are going to get a magnet an electric field okay and that's so here we see a connection between magnetism and uh, between mag magnetic fields and electric fields that's why we call it electromagnetism because they are connected oops this is off And now that we have that in general form, we have from previous chapters we have uh, Maxwell's equations, and they're kind of kind of want you to know what Maxwell's equations are. And one of the greatest intellectual achievements in the history of humanity, James Clark Maxwell, kind of put all this stuff together. And he took Gauss's law. Okay. And then he took Gauss's law for magnetism. Oh, sorry. But what's this equal to? 
Zero. See, charge, you can isolate a charge, but you can't isolate a north pole or a south pole because magnetic field lines always come in loops. At least that's our observation. That's, this is the mathematical description of that. And then we have um, Ampere's law. Okay, the expanded version of Ampere's law, the Ampere's Maxwell's law, where uh, if I change the electric field, if I have a, changing, a rate of change of electric flux, that will create a magnetic field. And now I've got um, uh, Faraday's law. If I have a, a changing rate of um, magnetic flux, that will create an electric field. And all of these together are called Maxwell's equations. And, what, and Maxwell took all these and just completely described electromagnetism with it. And in here is, is all kinds of Im important implications for special relativity and what is light and even quantum mechanics. This, kind of, this was a stepping stone to quantum mechanics and so on. So really amazing stuff here. Okay, now we go on, and this won't take as long. Uh, we're going to talk about inductance, or self-inductance. Inductance. So basically what we're saying here is that if I have a battery or some voltage source, I have a switch that's open like this. Maybe I've got a resistor in there, sure. I could put a capacitor in there if I want. If I close the, right now there's no current flowing. But if I close this switch, well now I get a rush of current. But when I get a rush of current starting up, I have well, where I, I used to not have a magnetic field, now I'm going to have a magnetic field. Uh, here's the area contained by the loop. And if I use the right-hand rule for loops, the current's going to be driving this way. I'm now creating magnetic field, like grab, grab with your right hand. You know, what's, what's circulating? What's circulating is the current. And so I grab it with my right hand, my thumb is down. So as the current starts at zero and then goes up to its maximum value, I have established a magnetic field contained by this loop. Now, sure, outside, there's also magnetic flux. An equal amount of magnetic, you know, it's, it's, if this is going down, it goes around and it comes back up. You know, these circulate around the wires. Okay, but we don't care about those on the outside. We only care about the flux contained by the loop. Well, it's going to say, um, no, actually, you're going to get an induced EMF. OK, here's, I'll just say this is the EMF of the battery. Well, you're going to get a back EMF. We call it a back EMF. And what they mean by back EMF is the in the in the opposite, you know, it's a voltage drop. Here's a voltage gain. So this is going to be a voltage drop for a temporary voltage drop. That's going to oppose the that's going to serve to induce a current that will oppose the rate of change of magnetic flux. Lenz's law. 
Now that that voltage, that very temporary voltage drop in the circuit is only going to depend, well, it's equal to negative d v dt. But what's changing with time out here is current. And that's the only thing that's going to change with time. The area doesn't change. The, the, the nature of the vacuum of space around this thing isn't changing with time. The only thing changing with time is the current. So what we do is we say this back EMF is going to be equal to negative di dt. And then everything else we're just going to dump into this thing we're going to call inductance, L. Okay, now when you multiply L times di dt, what are you going to get? You're going to get volts. This is a voltage drop caused by the changing current in the circuit. And, uh, and so inductance, uh, we, we use the letter L to represent inductance in the circuit, just like we use the letter R to represent resistance in the circuit. Uh, and, uh, you know, what are the units for this? Well, it's volts. We want to end up with volts, but we got to get rid of DIDT. What is DIDT? Amps per second. So, you know, if I have 20 volts per amp per seconds, that's the inductance, if I multiply this time this, I get volts, right? Because the amp per second cancels the amp per second up here. And this volts per amp per second is called a Henry, which we abbreviate with an H. It's called a Henry. I think it's the only unit named after an American. A whole bunch of Europeans and stuff. Okay. So uh, anyway, all, all circuits have a little bit of inductance, uh, self-inductance to them, okay? And it's because, uh, now one of the things that we did, like, okay, let me put a capacitor in here. Remember when we studied uh, RC circuits? When we close that switch, if I were to graph current as a function of time, I said, okay, the current starts off at its maximum value and then ramps down. Well, but current is a flow of something that's real, you know, charge moving in a wire. How does something go from zero to its maximum without any time going by? It can. It has to ramp up to it. So in reality, what happens, if you were to take a microscope and blow this part of it up, the eye would start at zero and very rapidly ramp up to its maximum and then go down like this. Okay, that's in reality what's happening. Of course, though, what do we say when we're saying with an RC circuit? The amount of time to do this is negligible. We neglect it because that makes doing the problem possible, okay? And it's also very real. I mean, it's very practical. In physics, we make practical simplifying assumptions so that we can understand something essential about the universe. It's not cheating, all right? So, so really in an RC circuit, there is a little bit of inductance there, but usually in, in a circuit, like if, if you have a flashlight, you know, and a, you, you turn it on, it comes on instantly, and you pretty much get instantaneous current, yeah. Now, this is billions of a second, that self induct because the inductance of that circuit is so tiny. L is so tiny that it really doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take up much time at all to ramp up. But, I can create a device that dramatically increases 
the, in, the self inductance or the inductance of a circuit by using a device called an inductor. So what I do is I say, okay, look, here's my circuit. And here's my resistor. I'm not gonna put a capacitor in there because we don't do RLC circuits. But then we want to dramatically in increase the inductance. So what I really have to do is dramatically increase the area contained by this loop. But I want my circuit to fit in my little radio box or whatever. So what I do is I take a little chunk of this wire and I go with each loop I'm adding this area to the area of the whole circuit to the point where this is so big you don't even care about this area it's negligible so th and this is an inductor now this is a really stupid way to draw this it's a coil basically it's a coil and so we have a symbol for it you know well you basically take a, a wire and it doesn't even have to be in the same plane. Since we're neglecting this area, it doesn't matter what plane that area is in. We just take the wire, here comes the wire, it goes up and down, over, 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 a zillion times. Now I'm not gonna draw it a zillion times because this lecture's too long already. It's just a solenoid. And of course we don't draw the symbol for a, it's just uh, this. That's a symbol for an inductor. And it just tells you, um, it just, it, it's a device to control or determine the, in, the inductance of a circuit. Okay. So, where am I? So let's take a look at this now. Now I've got, well, let's redraw it. got R, I've got an inductor, here's the EMF of the battery, here's uh, R and here's L. Now if I look at this in terms of voltage drops or gains, I got a voltage gain here, it's adding energy, and then minus IR, and then minus L DIDT. Equals zero, and I think I reviewed this the other day. I think I, I you know, one of my review lectures. I'm just going to do it again though. Um, if you want to take this and um, you can take this and divide it by the resistance because it's kind of nice to think of everything in terms of current. E over R. What is that? Well, that's going to be the maximum current minus I. What is I, I, is, I is the current at any given time, right? Minus uh, L over R di dt equals zero. Now look, this is in amps. This is in amps. This is in amps per seconds. So L over R has to have units of seconds in order to cancel out the dt here. So uh, this is going to be my time constant. Now what we did from here, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing here because we're already 40 minutes into this. Um, we went through a proof for LR circuits on what the current looks like as a function of time. But it's an easy it's an easy one to recreate if you remember that it's an exponential function and you look at this and you go oh L over R has units of seconds let's look at current as a function of time we want the current to start at zero and this inductor says uh-uh you cannot change the current without a little bit of time going by you know 
you want a current to go through this circuit you here's my open switch and then i close it no oh you you want all that current to flow you got to go through me you got to pay the piper you got to pay the inductor with what with energy okay so but in any case you have a voltage drop here from here to here because energy is leaving the circuit you uh, you get an a uh, uh, voltage drop here why because you're establishing a magnetic field and as we're going to see that will store energy and so the current is going to at first um, there's no current flow yet time hasn't uh, you know <coughs> t equals zero <coughs> But energy still has to be conserved, so you got a voltage, you got no current, no voltage drop here, all the voltage drop is across here. But then current starts to flow, and as it flows, you got more voltage drop here, you got less available here, which means the IDT is less. Now the voltage drop is, is uh, L times the IDT. So if this is less, so the L hasn't changed, L is a constant, the inductance is a constant. But the IDT has to go down if this voltage drop is going to go down. And what happens is you get an exponential function that looks like this until this is E over R. That's going to be my maximum current, and it's going to exponentially approach that. Well, what is this? E to the negative T over tau. What is tau? L over R. That's my tau. And uh, now, is it 1 minus E, or is it just E? I know I'm going to have a E over R. Do I put a 1 minus in front of that? Well, what is E to the negative T over LR at T equals 0? Well, that's E to the 0 power. What is E to 0 power? 1. So if I want it to start, if I want it, if I want the current to be zero, I have to subtract that. So one minus. Okay, that looks terrible. And that's my exponential function for current as a function of time in the LR circuit. Now, if I want to, if I want to create a switch like this, and I take this switch that was doing this, and then I do this with it, which you'll have. That's kind of a, you can kind of think of it as a quote-unquote discharging inductor. That's really not a very nice word to use, discharging, because that's really what capacitors do. But in any case, now the current's going to start going to zero again. But in this case, we are going to start off, you know, before I closed that switch, the current was flowing at its maximum value, E over R. And now it's going to exponentially decay. And that's going to be E over R times E to the negative T over uh, L over R. Okay, and so this is, if I close that, and this is going to keep current flowing for a little while. And we, we derive these using fancy calculus stuff. I'm not going to do that, though, again. Now, the source of this is the uh, energy in that inductor. Remember, inductors uh, create... Uh, I mean, inductors store energy. How much energy? Well, it's use, uh, use of L. And again, this was something that was derived. And almost all these devices, you start off with a one half. Like if it's the energy stored in capacitor, you start off with one half. Why? Because you gotta, you gotta charge it up. And the first half is easy. It's the second half that's much harder. So you get an average kind of a thing, one half, L I squared, and that's the only one. That's the energy stored in this guy right here. Yes. The UL is the energy stored. 
Huh? U L S energy stores Well, what is what what do we use the capital letter U for? Is potential energy, right? So that's the the ener or or stored up energy. If I hold a brick over your head, I've got gravitational potential energy stored. Okay, if um, I have an electric field and I have a charged particle in that electric field, it has electric potential energy. If I take a rubber band and stretch it, it as elastic potential energy, well, this has uh, energy stored in that magnetic field. There was one thing I did talk about. Okay, where is it? Oh, and an ideal toroid, I'm just going to show you the book, I'm going to write it down. Um, review this, this is a nice thing to know. Um, if you have a, um, an inductor that's a solenoid, a toroid, or an ideal carrying a current I and containing N turns is L equals N times V sub B over I. That's the uh, inductance of an N-turn coil that I'm already going too long. So take a look at that. I'm just telling you, take a look at that. Um, that was derived. Last thing. And that's LC circuits. No resistance. Resistance is futile in this problem. So how do you set this up? Well, you get a battery, and a circuit will probably have a little bit of resistance in it. Okay, I'm a liar. All right, then you put a capacitor in there, and you have an inductor, and you have a switch. Let's put the switch like this. So if you leave this on for a long time, it, uh, you won't have any, any current flowing through it, right? This is just a wire sticking out here. It's not doing anything. You leave this on for a long time. What happens? Well, this shoves current through, but then uh, as it fills up the capacitor, uh, the capacitor will get full. And once it's full, uh, I won't take any more. You, you, oh, you want more charge in me? You need more voltage. You need a bigger battery. So it says, hey, for this battery right here, this is the most charge you're going to store in here. And once that's stored, you're, you're done. There's no more current flowing through. So you have this guy right here. So what have we got? We've got, um, in terms of voltage, we've got E minus, uh, oh, what is it, uh, Q over C. Oh, why did I zoom in so much? And then you have minus L D I D T. And that's equal to zero. Well then when you close this switch, all you've done is cut this thing out. It now vanishes. So now I've got this equation. And uh, so what you end up doing, if I solve for uh, di dt, let's solve this for di dt. You get, uh, let's put this on the other side, you get q over c. And then I divide by l, or divide by negative l, and you get this. But what is, what is I? I is dq dt. Wow. 
Well, here I have a quantity, and here I have that quantity second derivative, negative in front, and a constant right there. What is that? Simple harmonic motion. The solution to this differential equation is a cosine or a sine wave. Okay, so, um, and so this right here is omega squared. And, uh, you know, when you dealt with simple harmonic motion. So omega equals 1 over the square root of LC. And uh, this is the frequency, the angular frequency at which this thing oscillates. And you can get the period of oscillation. The period of oscillation is equal to 2 pi over omega. And uh, so basically what will happen is that the electricity, the charge, will oscillate between the capacitor and the inductor. You'll have maximum charge. That charge will leave. The circuit will ramp up to maximum current. It'll reach maximum current the instant that capacitor is discharged. But, but maximum current means maximum, all the energy is now stored in the inductor. So now that this has run out of charge, it, tries, it doesn't want to push the current anymore. But this says, no, 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 you got to keep the current going. And as it keeps the current going, it starts filling the capacitor until the capacitor is full. Uh, now the current has stopped. There's no more vo uh, vo voltage here. And then this thing will push the charge mm -hmm. out again. And it will just oscillate back and forth. Very much like a mass spring system. And so a nice thing to look at, to study, is this chart right here on page 1017. Isn't that amazing? And we have a textbook where we've reached page 1017. All right, we'll zoom in. Well, that's, that's about as close as I can zoom in. 1017 of your book. And it compares a, a mass spring system to an LC circuit. And really what, what it is, it's kind of like the, the capacitor is kind of like the spring. And the inductor is kind of like the kinetic energy of the oscillating mass. So here we have uh, the maximum displacement of the spring, but we have no motion. Here we have maximum charge at the capacitor, but we have no current. You release it, it, it reaches the equilibrium position on, this, on the mass spring system. Now all the energy is uh, in the kinetic energy. But here, all the energy is now in the inductor maximum current. But the capacitor is now empty. Well, then the spring this mass continues on until it compresses the spring to its maximum compression. That's like when the capacitor is full again, but now the positive charge, which was on the top plate, is now on the bottom plate. And it will just oscillate like that back and forth forever. And we have electromagnetic uh, oscillators, LC circuits. They're in your digital, they're in, in watches and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, it's very, it's a, it's a common little thing to, to have um, in the electronic world. So uh, I think we have covered all the basics for this stuff here. Uh, it's so hopefully. You'll be fine. That is all.